My earliest memory is one of shock and disillusionment. It was a frosty winter morning in Colorado. Our family was preparing to go somewhere, and for some reason the plan was to take my dad's brown Chevy truck. Like most mem early memories, this one is fuzzy and brief, but I recall standing in the living room and watching my dad as he opened the front door and then stopped. He, he was arrested suddenly, surprised. Well, nothing major had actually happened, he simply realized that he had forgotten to warm up the truck. For my three-year-old self, this was unthinkable. In that moment, I had an existential crisis. Until that point, my dad had been perfect. I had never witnessed him make a mistake. He was strong, smart, invincible, and never wrong. Quite suddenly, he became human, and I was bereft. My hero pedestal was empty. In the years since then, my dad has forgotten other things and made other mistakes some of them far more serious. But rarely have these failures jarred me the way this first one did. I'd like us to sit in that existential crisis for a few moments together, because I think it will help us enter the Psalms. As a toddler, I could rest knowing that dad had everything under control. He could be the parent and I could be the child. I could depend on him. But on that frosty morning, I learned that I could not always rely on my dad. He was human, and that made me profoundly vulnerable. Have you had a moment like that? One where you realized that the one who had pledged to protect you and care for you had failed? Do you think of a parent, a teacher, a pastor, a friend? Psalm 89 is our focus today, but any number of psalms could have fit this profile. In Psalm 89, we come face to face with the disillusionment of the psalmist. Life is not working out the way he imagined. And it's not just a matter of human mistakes. For the psalmist, the problem is far more disturbing than a not yet warmed up Chevy truck. The existential crisis of the psalmist is far weightier. This time, God has let him down. The psalm begins in a way we would expect, celebrating God's faithful love and remembering his promises. This is what we're used to seeing in the psalms. Verse 1 reads, I will sing of Yahweh's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. This sounds a lot like what we sang together this morning. Your goodness is running after me. These two words, love and faithfulness, are key to the entire psalm. God's chesed, or loyal love, and his emunah, or faithfulness, are part of how God defines himself. Yahweh is not the type to make promises and then flake out. When God commits, God is committed. Verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Tzedek and Mishpat, righteousness and justice, mean that God is the kind of king who makes the right decisions and does what is best. Chesed and Emet, loyal love and faithfulness, these character qualities come straight from God's self-declaration of his character at Sinai in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. So here we are in Psalm 89, on the heels of Psalm 88, which is the darkest and most distressing of all the psalms. This is a welcome relief. Central to the psalmist reflections in Psalm 89 is the promise of a king who will sit on David's throne. Verses 3 and 4 call this to mind. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. 
In 2 Samuel 7, God sent a prophet to assure David of the divine plan to build and preserve David's dynasty. As the psalm says in verse 28, I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. This psalm is attributed to Ethan the Ezraite, a man named in 1 Kings 431 as a contemporary of King Solomon, son of David. In Ezra's own lifetime, Yahweh selected David's family to occupy the throne. So Ezra got to see this happen. Solomon, son of David, ushered the nation into a time of unparalleled prosperity and peace. But now, as the psalmist gazes at Jerusalem, he is bereft, disillusioned. Far more serious than my disillusionment on that frosty winter morning, evidently, the true author of this psalm had lived long enough to watch the wheels fall off the wagon. It appears to be set after the Babylonian exile. Strongholds are reduced to ruins. Neighboring nations have plundered Jerusalem, and the king's reign has ended. The psalmist voices what Ethan the Ezraite surely would have said if he had lived long enough to witness this tragedy. It just doesn't make sense. How can Yahweh, full of loyal love and faithfulness, whose goodness is running after us and whose grace is amazing, How could he have allowed this devastation to happen to the nation he loved and to whom he made promises? The most striking aspect of this communal lament is how it looks God full in the face and lays the blame at God's feet. Beginning in verse 38, the recital of God's faithfulness takes a dark turn. But you have rejected, you have spurned, You have been very angry with your anointed one. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. You've broken through all his walls, reduced his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by have plundered him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all his enemies rejoice. Indeed, you have not turned back the edge of his sword and have not supported him in battle. You have put an end to his splendor and cast his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth. You have covered him with a mantle of shame. Is a prayer like this actually allowed? Isn't this a demonstration of faithlessness, an embarrassment of apostasy, Isn't this the equivalent of like back talk at the dinner table, the kind of talk that gets you a mouthful of soap suds? Apparently not. By naming God as the one responsible for Judah's devastation, the psalmist affirms God's ultimate sovereignty. He realizes he can't lay the blame on anyone else for Judah's predicament. He firmly believes that God is on the throne. He is, in effect, a Calvinist, long before Calvin. You can laugh. (laughs) I know, it's heavy. It's remarkable, really, that this prayer ended up in our Bibles. Faithful Jews preserved it for us, not as exhibit A in backsliding, but as a shining example of how to pray. True prayer does not hide the truth or just tell the boss what he's looking to hear. True prayer wrestles openly and honestly with the only one who is actually able to solve life's most most vexing problems. In Psalm 89, the psalmist turns his distress into prayer by voicing his deepest anxieties in God's presence. How long, Lord? Will you hide yourself forever? Lord, where is your former great love, your hesed, which in your faithfulness, your emunah, you swore to David? We talked about that, right? That is true about you, right? Because I'm looking out on this world and I don't see it. Book three of the Psalms closes with this unanswered question hanging in the air. This 
is prayer. No neat and tidy answers or happy endings required. Just a heartfelt plea for God to act in a way consistent with his character and true to his promises. The Psalms invite us to bring our disillusioned desires into the presence of God. So for two years now, we've been living in a sort of twilight zone, haven't we? The losses that we cheerfully shouldered at first became almost more than we could bear, running dangerously low on toilet paper or having to wear a mask at the store have given way to long-term, low-grade anxiety about whether we could ever expect to return to normal. I'm preaching without a mask today, and most of you are not wearing masks, glory to God, but this is a new and recent development. We experienced two years with loss of embodied community, loss of opportunities to travel, loss of family time, loss of in-person classes, loss of access to life-giving routines, things like exercise, recreation, work, and worship. Some of the most important milestones in our lives have had to be postponed or curtailed. Graduations, funerals, weddings. And when we did see each other, it was from behind a screen or behind a mask without a handshake or a hug. We're not meant for this. And the long-term wear and tear on our souls is starting to show. I can see it in the classroom. I've been wondering how much community we've lost by averting our gaze, keeping our distance, or just not showing up at all. We hold back when we're not sure whether we're even going to be heard or understood. We depend far more than we realized on reading lips and recognizing facial expressions. Who knew chins were so important? I'm speaking in generalities here, but we could each fill in the list with our own losses, canceled trips, loss of income, ongoing isolation, sickness, and death of loved ones. Since the pandemic started, my daughter has lost her marriage, and my parents are losing theirs, one agonizing day at a time. How I wish I could go back to that time in my life when my worst father issue was that he forgot to warm up the truck. You've missed out on a multi-dimensional college or sem seminary experience. You'll likely remember last year as the year we couldn't do anything. Many of you in this room have experienced a mental health crisis or the inability to focus on your work that persists until today. I'm told there's a huge increase in adult onset ADHD symptoms. How long, Lord? Bubbling underneath these pandemic-related losses are deeper questions and crises related to race and gender, politics and power. For some of us, these challenges are far more concerning than viruses and vaccines. Apparently, pastors and evangelists can't always be trusted. Law enforcement officers are not always safe. Presidents and governors don't always work in our best interests. Those with power often fail to wield it on behalf of justice and truth. Leaders fail to protect the vulnerable. Some churches, including churches not far from here, continue to sideline victims and protect perpetrators of horrific abuse. And somehow, on top of all this, in spite of most of the world's sharp disapproval, Russia inches ever closer to a takeover of Ukraine, with millions fleeing the carnage. We are weary. We wonder if it will always be this way. We may even wonder if God has forgotten us. How long, Lord? Are you committed to building your church so that the gates of hell will not prevail? When will you take action to set the oppressed free and heal the brokenhearted? Are you really making all things new? Lord, we're waiting on you. We're waiting with an armload of grief and a truckload of disappointment and disillusionment. Have you forgotten us? 
Psalm 89 ends without resolution. The question hangs in the air, awaiting God's answer. I appreciate this because it mimics our own experience in prayer. We don't come to God in prayer because we already have the answers, but because we're seeking answers. We're invited to bring our angst and lay it at the feet of Jesus. Sometimes when we look out over our world, God does not appear to be protecting the innocent or holding the wicked accountable. And in times like these, with Psalm 89 as our model, we can intercede on the basis of God's own character. God, I believe you are good. Where is your goodness now? God, I believe you are powerful. Where is your power now? God, I believe you're my provider. Where is your provision? God, I believe you're a healing God. Why have you not healed? God, where is your compassion? Have you forgotten us? You say you do not leave the guilty unpunished. Why then are the wicked getting away with murder? How long, Lord? Psalm 89, this snapshot of one in distress, is not the final word. Our prayers never are. So book four of the Psalms, the very next Psalm, opens with a prayer of Moses, the man of God. It's as though in the wake of a failed Davidic covenant, the scribes who arranged the Psalms decided they're going to have to reach back even further, before David, all the way back to Sinai, so that Moses himself could intercede. You remember that Moses interceded at Sinai when the Israelites had committed apostasy with the golden calf. Somehow he convinced God not to destroy them in spite of Israel's guilt. And so now, with the Davidic dynasty in shambles, Moses offers a prayer of intercession as a last-ditch effort. Psalm 90, the Psalm of Moses, recognizes God's multi-generational faithfulness and on that basis calls for God to intervene. Like Ethan the Ezraite in Psalm 89, Moses prays, relent, Yahweh. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Moses' plea also ends without resolution. But Psalm 91, offers Yahweh's response to these earnest prayers. If you've been among the many, many Christians who just assumed that the book of Psalms was a random grab bag of of prayers in no particular order, I hope this convinces you otherwise. The progression between Psalm 88 to 89 to 90 to 91 is absolutely stunning. Psalm 91 gives Yahweh's answer to these earnest prayers. Because he loves me, says Yahweh in verse 14, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And after this, the Psalms take a turn to exuberant praise. Implicit in this arrangement of psalms is the answer to unanswered prayer. You personally may not be there yet. You may still be in the darkness of Psalm 88, or the distress of Psalm 89, or the urgency of Psalm 90. You may not have your answer yet. Hang in there. The same God who responded to an onslaught with a pledge to protect is the God who is with you and for you, a God who has not forgotten his promises, a God whose goodness really is running after you. God may be silent at this moment, giving us space to fully express our need, but Yahweh is gracious and compassionate, full of loyal love and faithfulness. Your story is not over yet. Our story is not over yet. So let's keep holding on until God acts in a way that's consistent with God's own character. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. 
Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.